All right, so I'm kind of curious, how many of you men told your wife this week you love her with all of your intestines? <laughs> now, if you weren't here last week, you probably wonder what went on. You know, when you miss out on a Sunday, you miss some good marital advice, right? Well, we're finishing our third week of reading through the, uh, the New Testament uh, speaking of reading through the New Testament, how many of you learned how to ride a bicycle? Most everybody in this room. Did you ever fall off when you were learning how to ride? What did you do? Get right back up. You may have already fallen off the wagon this first three weeks of reading. Let me encourage you to get right back up. Get started again. Uh, if you did not get a New Testament journal, there are still some available out in the main lobby. And that will help you with your reading, not just to read, but to ask some questions. It will help you apply what God wants to speak to you about. All right, we're in, uh, we read this week Matthew 11 through 15. The message this morning is out of Matthew chapter 14. As you're turning there, uh, I raised a lot of questions last week about my comments on abolishing abortion. Uh, you have in your bulletin this morning a card that will explain a little more about that and what's going on. Um, l- let me just make one thing real clear that may help you understand why this is possible and doable. Um, and again, I'm not an attorney, but there's a doctrine called the doctrine of lesser magistrates. The doctrine of lesser magistrates says when a higher magistrate passes a law that is either unlawful or unjust, the lesser magistrate can choose not to abide by that law and even actively resist that law. And the idea behind the movement that's happening in our state If you think about it, and I'm not saying that this was an unjust law, but the law, the federal law that says that marijuana is a controlled substance, many states have chosen to ignore that and make their own laws. It's the same basic principle that we don't have to abide by the law of the land if we consider it unjust or unlawful. And and I will say most importantly, uh, biblically for us, it's what Peter said to the Sanhedrin, We choose to obey God, not men. When the laws of men violate the laws of God, we choose to obey God, not men. Now, let me me also say this very quickly. Um, When we say we're pro-life, I understand that pro-life is not just being anti-abortion. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, we had several different agencies that we partner with in the lobby. It's not just about uh, saving the baby. We had some uh, crisis pregnancy centers here. We, that, that worked not only with the baby, but moms who are in difficult pregnancies. We had uh, Deeper Still Ministries here who works with women who are post-abortive. We had Children's Home here. It was a whole spectrum. And as a body of Christ, if we're going to be pro-life, we can't just be against abortion. We have to look at the whole picture and speak into every part uh, of that picture. All right, Matthew chapter 14, we're going to be looking down in verses uh, 22 through 33 of Matthew 14 this morning. You know from your reading this week, that Jesus has been teaching about the kingdom of God primarily through parables. He's been healing a lot of people. And in the section immediately preceding where we're reading in verse 22 is Matthew's record of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, there's two objectives this morning, very simply. Let me just lay those out for you, what we're trying to accomplish this morning. One is um, some insight on how to uh, survive storms when they come, because they will come. A former pastor of ours, Bruce Chester, used to always say, everyone is either coming out of a storm or about to go into the storm, although they may not know it. So we want some insight on how to survive storms. But then also, you you may be here this morning, you're not in a storm. We want to understand from this passage how to move from faith to fear, how, how to step out in faith in our walk with Christ. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat. Remember, this is following the feeding of the 5,000. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. That's the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Mark tells us in his account, probably around Bethsaida, Capernaum, in that area. He made them go the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's between 3 and 6 a.m., in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I, don't be afraid." And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. 
So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. What you see immediately before is the feeding of the 5,000. That's, that's probably a misnomer. It was probably more like twenty to 25,000. If you read carefully, it says that Jesus fed 5,000 men and also the women and children. So this phenomenal miracle that had just taken place, but immediately after that, as soon as they finish feeding the people, he sends the disciples away, and then he himself dismisses the crowd. Why is that? You'd think there was much more to be done. You'd think after feeding the people, they'd be very open to his teaching. Maybe there are many who still need to be healed. But immediately, he sends them away. Well, Jesus is at a real high point of his ministry, a point of great popularity. Uh, crowds who begin to follow him, not just for the teaching, but probably more for the miracles and what he could do for them. The disciples themselves still didn't really get the picture of what the kingdom of God was about. They were hopeful that Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom and they would be hot shots. They would have uh, high positions in this kingdom. In fact, in John's account, in John chapter 6 of this same story after the feeding of the 5,000, the next morning after Jesus had sent the crowds away, um, they were back. And Jesus straight up tells them, hey, I know why you're here. I'm your meal ticket. You're just looking for another miracle. You're not really serious about the kingdom of God. So Jesus uh, immediately stopped what was happening in, in, uh, in this account and sent the disciples away and sent the crowds away because this is not what his kingdom was about. These were people who were looking for an advantage from Jesus. And you know, that ought to make us stop and ask the question ourselves, why do I follow Jesus? What advantage is there to me of being a follower of Christ? What's in my heart when I consider my purpose and reason for following Jesus? So he sends the disciples on and he dismisses the crowd. And you see in verse 23 it says, after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. He's not going to stick around to reap the political benefits. He doesn't need the, the accolades of the crowd. What he needs is prayer. Prayer is central to his ministry. Why? Well, first of all, and most importantly, he needs, because he's in human bodily form, although he's God, he's deity, he's also humanity, he needs a connection and the communion with the Father. To fulfill the Father's purpose, he needs to stay connected in communication with the Father. But the other thing I want you to see is Jesus is up on that mountain. He recognizes what's going on with the disciples, and he is very likely praying for them. Why? Look at verse 24. He sent the disciples into a difficult situation. Do you hear me? He sent the disciples into what he knew would be a difficult situation. This past Wednesday night, I bumped into Mike Perkins, and Mike and I were talking about the reading through the New Testament. It's, it's pretty cool when you think about it that so many of our body are reading the same thing together. It's easy to have conversations. And Mike was saying, you know, it was pretty interesting to see in the, in the first week that God sent Jesus to a safe place to, eat, to protect him, but then in the second week, God sent Jesus to be tempted of the devil in the wilderness. It's all about his purpose. Whatever God does in our lives, whatever God allows in our lives, when he brings storms in our lives, it's all about accomplishing his purpose. Now, what are the disciples doing? They're trying to obey his command. It's very dark. As I said, they, they left right after the feeding. That was around dinner time. This is now about 3 a.m. So for nine hours, they've been trying to obey his command. It's dark. The, the storm is violent. The wind is blowing against them. They're really going nowhere. They're making no progress. And if you think about it from the stem of the disciples, because they're, they're trying to row across the sea into the wind, it would have been much easier to just turn around and let the wind blow them back to where they came from. But they kept on, and, and they kept on striving. And, and I would say, when you think about the disciples being in this experience, I don't know if they realize this, but it's always safer when we're in a place of obedience. The easy thing would have been to turn around and go back, but Jesus had told them to go to the other side, and in spite of the storm, they may not have known it, but they were in the safest place they could be. You know, when my uh, daughter Sarah and, and her husband and their children were in the Middle East, I would frequently have people ask me, is it safe? Are they safe over there? 
And I, I could tell you, just without any scriptural answer, they were probably safer there than here, but I can tell you biblically, I'm absolutely assured they were safer there because they were in the will of God while they were there. That's where he told them to go. You're always safer in a place of obedience. Well, the disciples, the, the wind is against them, the storm is howling. Despite how the, their circumstances look, they're secure. How do we know that? Because Jesus is interceding for them, just like he does for us when we're in a place of storm. They may be fearful that they could even lose their lives, but they are secure because Jesus is interceding for them. Verse 25, it says, he came to them walking on the water. How, how is that possible? Well, Jesus made the sea, right? So he can certainly walk on the sea. And it doesn't matter how dark it is. It doesn't matter uh, the, the storm, the darkness of the storm. He knows where to walk. More importantly, he knows where they are. Jesus knew exactly where they were in the midst of the storm. But, but think about this. They've been struggling all night. They left after dinner. They struggled through the first three watches of the night from, from uh, 6 to 9, from 9 to 12, from 12 to 3. It's now 3 a.m., and they're still struggling. Listen, Jesus knew where they were when he was on the mountain praying. He could have calmed the storm from the mountain, right? He could have made sure the storm never started. Jesus allowed the storm, and he allowed their struggle. He could have come sooner, but he came at just the right time because he wanted them to see and experience his power, not only in their lives, but his power over even the very elements. And he wanted them to know that he could handle any storm. And that's a word for many of you today who find yourselves in the storm. Listen, if you're in the middle of a storm right now, nothing is hidden from him. He knows right where you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. He hasn't taken his eyes off you. He's got his eye on you even in the storm. Verse 27, here he comes walking, and, and, and they cry out in fear. What does he say? Take courage. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. It, it's me, guys. Take courage. No matter how severe the storm, no matter how hopeless it seems, Jesus says, I am here. So in the extreme moments of life and in the storms of life, there is no need to fear. He's here. He's going to respond to our needs. Verse 28, here comes Peter. You know, it's easy to look at this and knowing what we know about Peter, think he's really being presumptuous or he's just showing off. Lord, if it's you, well, tell me to come to you. But if you really know Peter, you understand that, that Peter just wanted to be where Jesus was. He always wanted to be where Jesus was. Peter deeply loved Jesus and, and he trusted Jesus. And so on hearing that it was Jesus, he said, well, can I come to you? Or maybe Peter realized something we should all realize, and that is it's better, we're, we're better off being out with Jesus in the storm than in the boat without Jesus. We're better off being out with Jesus in the storm than being in the safety of the boat without Jesus. In the midst of the storm, Peter wanted to get to Jesus because he knew that he could trust Jesus. And Jesus responds very simply, come. Come. It's interesting that Peter, or Jesus invites Peter to step out knowing that Peter has a weak faith, knowing that Peter's faith is, is frail and even faulty. He just says, come, but behind come you hear, hey, Peter, I want you to come because it's going to be the greatest lesson of your life. Peter, I want you to come because this experience is going to build your faith. So his love for Jesus and his faith in Jesus gets Peter out of the boat and gets him into a situation he's never been in before. Peter's about to experience something with Jesus and about Jesus that he's never experienced before. And can I be honest with you, most of us don't want to go there. We like the comfort of our Jesus as we know him. We don't want to be stretched. We don't want to be put in, in, in difficult situations. We don't necessarily want to be taught. We just want to keep having the experience that we already have and we already know. But Jesus called Peter out. And how tempting is it to stay in the safety of the boat? 
I can't imagine Peter's thoughts as he's, as he's sitting on, on that gunwale and about to, to, to spin his feet out over the side. Can you imagine what he's thinking? It's a violent storm. The waves are huge. The wind is blowing. He has to be thinking, man, this is really dumb. I, I could get hurt. I, I could die. He has to be glancing back at his friends who are all cowering on the other side of the boat in fear. What is, what is he thinking? But he had to get out. And we have to get out. How does God build us? How, how does God build our faith? Here's how he does it. He puts us to the test so that he can show himself to be faithful and powerful. He puts us to the test so he can show himself to be faithful and powerful. Why? Because he likes to strut around and be a big shot? No. Who's he proving his power and his faithfulness to? He's proving it to us. When we step out and, and we learn that we can trust him more, he can also trust us further as we take those steps of faith. Well, Peter steps out, and you know the story, verse 30. It says that he looked, uh, he observed the wind. I imagine he felt the wind blowing on him. He, he felt the waves lapping at the hem of his robe. And when he starts looking at the wind and the waves, when he looks at his situation or his circumstances instead of Jesus, what happens? He begins to sink. Now, we could right here really condemn Peter for his lack of faith, but... Peter got out of the boat. And when he began to sink, he immediately, he knew to whom to cry for help. He cried to Jesus. He didn't, he didn't cry out to his buddies back in the boat, hey, throw me a life preserver, help me out here. He cried out to Jesus. You know, when I look at Peter's feeble attempt, feeble attempt to walk on water, I think it's a good picture of our feeble attempts to walk by faith. And sadly, there can be people that have been uh, Christians that, that say that they're followers of Christ, that have been believers for 20 or 30 or 40 years, but because they've not taken opportunities, they've not tried to step out when the Lord commands and the Lord calls them to something bigger than themselves, they're still walking around like babies or like toddlers. Peter's attempt here is feeble, but as you know, reading through the New Testament, you've read through it before, He's going to do some phenomenal things that take great faith, big steps of faith. You know, walking with Jesus and, and stepping out like Peter did is what strengthens us. When we're called out of the comfort and the safety of the, of the boat, like Peter was, we have to understand that Jesus may let us begin to sink. He's going to call us out where we are absolutely stretched to the limits of our faith and we think there's just no way. But when we look to him and when we cry out to him and when he saves us, our faith is increased and it's extended a little bit further. And the next time it's a little bit further, a little bit further because he's growing and, and building and strengthening our faith. Look what he says to Peter in verse 31. You of little faith... Why did you doubt? Now, Jesus is not speaking this harshly. It's not a condemnation of Peter's faith. It's a gentle rebuke or a gentle reminder. Hey, Peter, you know you can trust me, right? Peter, you, you know I, I was with you, right? Hey, Peter, you, you know I'm, I'm able to catch you and hold you up, right? Verse 32 you see the demonstration of Jesus' authority over any storm and crisis. In verse 33, you see the appropriate response when we recognize that in Jesus, and that is worship. The disciples thought they knew who Jesus was, but in this instance, and if you look in Mark 6 and John 6, in this instance, they say, who is this guy? And they worship they begin to realize that it's more important to fear God than to fear a storm in their lives. Well, I mentioned two obstacles. The first was insight on how to survive the storms. The second was how to step out in faith. Let's, let's think about very quickly, let me review for you what we said about surviving storms. God is going to allow storms. 
and sometimes even put us in storms. And when we're in the storm, we need to remember that Jesus is interceding for us. He's our high priest. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for us. He hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't taken his eyes off of us. He knows where we are, and he will come to us in the storm at just the right time. You know what the right time is? The time that will be for your maximum benefit in your relationship with him and your building of faith. Remember that we saw that the safest place is the place of obedience. Don't ever turn back. Don't ever turn back. Don't ever take the easier out. If Jesus has called you to go that way, then you go that way, and you know that as long as you're obedient, you're in the safest place you can be. We also see in the storm that Jesus is going to call us out from our place of comfort in the middle of the storm to increase our faith and to show us that we can trust him. He's going to prove himself uh, for us so that our faith will be strengthened and we won't keep walking like babies. Well, let's talk about the second objective. What about st just stepping out in faith? Maybe right now you're not necessarily in the, in the midst of a storm, but what about when God just calls you to step out in faith and to dare to do something big and something mighty for him? He's going to call you out. You know, a lot of Christians talk about Jesus, and a lot of Christians um, pattern their life after Jesus and even try to imitate his lifestyle, but it doesn't seem like many of us really experience his presence and power on a daily basis, at least not the way that, that Peter did in this circumstance. Uh, think about Peter. Peter had been with Jesus. But in this encounter in Matthew 14, Peter experienced the presence and the power of Jesus in a way that he never had before. So how can we have that experience of God's power? How can we grow in our faith? How can we be willing to, to take steps of faith? It all starts with belief. Do you believe that Jesus can do the impossible? Now, if I was asking for a response, most of you would say, well, yeah. I mean, the Bible has, has said that. You see that through his miracles. Do you believe Jesus can do the impossible? Yes. But what if I rephrase the question of this? Do you believe that Jesus can do the impossible through you. Do you believe that he can do the impossible through you? Grab your Bible and let's, let's take a quick tour. And if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one out of the pew rack in front of you because this is not going to be on the screens. Let's just take a quick tour and let's ask ourselves how many miracles had the disciples seen Jesus perform up to this point? We'll jump in at... Uh, at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Let's see, look down. Verse 23. Right after Jesus has called the disciples, he went through Galilee, teaching the synagogues, preaching good news, healing every disease and sickness. Hey, John, come up here a minute. I need you to help me real quick. Bring a, bring a pen and something to write on. We're going to total this up. Are you good at math? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, healing every disease and sickness, people brought him who were ill with various diseases, severe pain, demon-possessed, seizures, paralyzed. I don't know how many that is. Sounds like a whole lot. You, you think 100 is a fair number there? Can we say 100? Okay, put 100 down. That's not a pen and paper. I bet if you were a Walmart checker, you couldn't make change, could you? Yes, I could. <laughs> I'd make him use credit cards. You'd make him use a credit card. All right, skip on through the teaching there in Matthew 5 and 6 and 7. Look over in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, the first part of Matthew 8, he heals a man with leprosy. That's one. Uh, he heals the centurion's servant. Then over in Matthew 8, 14, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Then it says, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. He drove out spirits of the word, healed all the sick. We're going to go conservative again. Let's just do another hundred there, Okay. Could have been a lot more than that, but we'll stay concerned with that. All right, that's chapter 8. Uh, let me see, look here. Chapter 8, down in verse 23. Oh, wow, look at this. He'd already been with the disciples in a storm. That's just one, but it's a big one. Then uh, verse 28 of chapter 8, he heals two demon-possessed men. Chapter 9, he heals a paralytic. Y'all with me? Uh, chapter 9, verse 18, he heals a dead girl. He heals a sick woman. 
chapter 9, verse 27, he heals the blind and mute. That was two men, two blind men. I'm sorry, two blind men and then also a man who was mute. So that's three. Okay. Um, here you see in chapter 9, now these words look familiar, but it's not the same instance. He's going through the towns and villages. This is our message last week, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. Let's just do 100 again just to uh, keep it the same, okay? All right, chapter 10, chapter 11, uh, chapter 12, verse uh, looks like 22. They brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus healed him so they could both walk and see. What else we got? 12, 13, he's teaching. Okay, chapter 14, he feeds 5,000. Do we count that as one or we count that as 5,000? What do you think? What do you think? 5,000? 5,000. Okay, and the grand total is? 5,313. 5,313 miracles the disciples had seen Jesus perform up to this point. 5,313 miracles. How many disciples believed it was Jesus on the water? How many disciples took a, a leap of faith? It's one. Madeline Murray O'Hare, and for those of you who are younger may not know who that is, uh, she's the one who really worked hard to get prayer out of our schools. Madeline Murray O'Hare was interviewed one time, and she was asked why people were afraid of her. And she said, well, I don't know, but I can tell you why some Christians are. They're not sure that what they believe is true. If they were, I wouldn't be a threat to them at all. Christians aren't sure that what they believe is true. Are, are you sure of what you believe? Do you believe that God is who he says he is? Do you believe that he is sovereign and that he is, is, is powerful? Do you believe he's got you and you can trust him with your life? It starts with believing. The, the disciples believed. They had seen 5,000, what was it, 313? 5,313 miracles, but they didn't believe enough to step out in faith. Listen, if you say you believe Jesus, you got to believe it with your body, okay? You got to step out. You got to take a, a, a leap of faith. And the question this morning is in what area of your life do you have to trust God? You can't figure it out on your own. You can't make it work on your own. In what area of your life do you have to trust God? If there's not one of those areas, then I think you need to really see and, and ask the question, am I doing everything that Jesus has called me to do? Because it's not about you living life the way that you can live life. It's about being in this venture uh, of faith. You have to believe. The second thing is this. You have to leave everything to come to Jesus. What, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, you have to leave your sin. Some of us haven't left our, our sin behind. And, and maybe part of the reason for that is we're not sure how God's going to respond to us when we bring our sin to him. We're, we're, we're too worried about how he might respond, and we forget the promises of his word. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't need to hold on to it. We need to bring it to the only one who can forgive our sin and cleanse us and remove the guilt and bring us out from under judgment. We have to do that if we're going to be able to be used by him and serve him and take great steps of faith. Psalm 103, 12, he separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, let us consider as, as we are running the race with Jesus, let us consider that the way that we do that is to cast off every sin and encumbrance. You better not step out of the boat if you've got an anchor of sin around your, around your waist. You've got to leave your sin, but you also have to leave yourself and your stuff. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, Do not love the world nor the things in the world, for the love of the Father is not in the world. For all that is in the world, listen, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father but from the world, and the world is passing away, and so are its lust. What, what, is, what is John saying here? Listen, if there's anything you want to do, that's the lust of the flesh. If there's anything you want to have, that's the lust of the eyes. If there's anything you want to be, that's the pride of life. If any of those things are in your life, you better let them go. 
What do you have in this life that gives you great pleasure? What gives you great pleasure? Can it be lost? What is it that you really hold tightly? Can it be taken away? You see, if you've not been willing to relinquish all the things of this life, you're going to be tempted to hang on and stay in the comfort and the safety of the boat because you're too worried about what you might have to give up. You've got to leave your sin and yourself and your stuff, and you even have to leave or let go of your own life. What did Jesus say in Luke 9, 23? If anyone wishes to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross. What's the cross? The cross is not a pretty ornament or a piece of jewelry. The cross is a symbol of death. Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself. You have to let go of yourself and let go of your stuff and be willing to die, let go of your life if you're going to follow me. Paul in Romans 6, 11 said it this way, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. See, you can't be alive to God until you're dead to sin. And when he calls you out, just like Peter, you might hang out on the edge of the boat and think, man, that looks like I could really get hurt out there. In fact, that looks like I could die out there. Yes, but if you believe God with your body, if you leave, you're willing to step out and leave everything behind, you will experience the presence and the power of God in a way that you never have before when you take that leap of faith. Peter, Peter was never the same. He still blew it, right? It's just a few chapters later, Jesus has to say to him, get behind me, Satan. But he knew where to turn to experience the presence and power of God in a fresh way. Why? Because Peter knew Jesus like no one else. Peter knew Jesus. Even though the 12 walked with him, Peter knew Jesus like they couldn't possibly know Jesus. No one else in the boat can know Jesus like the one who gets out of the boat to walk with Jesus. He knew Jesus. That's why in Matthew 16, when they're there on the, on the coast of Caesarea Philippi, where all the worship of all these pagan gods are, and, and some of you in a few weeks are going to be standing there and looking at the side of that mountain where there are all these places of pagan worship. In that setting, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And Peter had the answer, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. How did he know that? Because he'd experienced the Christ and, and, and the power of the Son of the living God. But remember again, when you think about Peter, if you're going to walk on water, if you're going to take a, a leap or a step of faith, you better keep your eyes on Jesus. What do you want your life to look like as a believer? It's all said and done. When, whenever your time comes and you have a moment to look back and reflect, what, what do you want your life as a follower of Christ to look like? Let me close with some words penned by Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt wasn't a theologian, but he said a pretty sound theological thing here to go with this passage. Far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered with failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Listen, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in the gray twilight. I don't want to get to the end of life and realize that I was comfortable and I didn't have any struggles and, hey, it was just a good life. Because I understand what's to come after this life. And understand that to have glorious triumphs, there are going to be some, some failures because I'm human. But I'd rather dare mighty things for God and experience some failures than to miss the blessing of glorious triumphs.